Hey everyone, welcome back. So we've done a lot of uh, life videos lately, for example, the true cost of a PhD or whether you should go to grad school. And I realized in most of those videos, we've had some kind of component of a break-even analysis where we said that this is the future earnings if you do choose to get a PhD and these are the future earnings if you don't. And look, the lines cross here. And so it's gonna take this long for you to see a return on your investment. But I realized that we never had a video talking about how to do such a calculation. And I also realized that just because of the school system, for example, when I was in school, no one ever taught me how to do a break-even analysis. Maybe I learned all the tools necessary, but I think it would be very helpful for the school system to emphasize things like, how do you know how long it's gonna to take to see returns on your investment? Because that's a very important thing for major points in your life when you're making transitions. So let's talk about that today. And so we'll talk about it in a real world terms. Let's say that you are here. So this is you, you're just chilling right there. And you're trying to decide right now whether to go back to school and get your PhD. And these are all the factors you have to consider. So I realize right now this looks daunting. There's so many numbers here. It's very unclear what to do. But first, let me explain all of these numbers and what they mean in physical terms. Then we're going to talk about a concept you may or may not have heard of called the present or future value of money, also sometimes called the time value of money. And once we've got that concept down, it's going to be pretty easy for us to figure out how to make this decision if the only factor in your decision is financial. For example, how long is it going to take me to see the return on my PhD? First, let's look at all of these numbers. So let's say you're currently making $80,000 per year. So you have a job, you're making $80,000 per year. Let's say now that you've also done your research for your PhD program, and you're convinced that if you get your PhD afterwards, you'll be able to land a job where you're gonna start at $150,000 per year. So quite a jump in between 80 and 150. Let's say that if you do choose to go get that PhD, they're gonna pay you $20,000 in stipend per year. So a stipend is just some money given to PhD students so they can survive, basically. And we have a couple other factors, too. Let's say that the growth in your salary is going to be 5% per year. What that means is that if you choose not to get a PhD, this $80,000 you're making is going to increase by 5% per year. So these are raises that you're getting annually. And also, if you do choose to get a PhD after five years, and then you have that job where you're making $150,000, that will also grow by 5% per year. The inflation rate is 2%. You may or may not have heard this word inflation, but generally what it means is that usually the cost of goods and services in an economy are increasing over time. And so we're saying that the value at which they're increasing is 2%. More on that in just a second. We also say that there is a 10% investment return. So what this means is that you have some kind of investment vehicle where if you put a certain amount of money in there today, in one year, that money is going to reliably grow by 10%. So this could be something like the stock market, where you invest in a stock that is reliably slowly growing over time, and you think that you can reliably get a 10% increase in your money per year. And the final parameter is that the PhD program is going to take you five years to complete from start to finish. Now again, this is a lot of information. It seems pretty scary right now, especially if you've never done a break-even analysis before, but stick with me. We're going to first learn a very important tool, and then after that, it's going to get pretty simple to do this break-even analysis. The tool we're going to learn, which you may or may not already know, is called the present future value of money or the time value of money. And let me explain it. So let's say you have $100 today. Now we said that you have some kind of investment vehicle, for example, some slow, steadily growing stock in the stock market, which is going to grow by 10% per year. So if you have $100 today, you can reliably have $110 a year from now, so it's going to grow by 10%. Now we also know that the inflation rate is 2%. So for example, you have an apple today, let's say, which costs $1. Since the cost of goods and services in the economy are increasing on average by 2% per year, that same apple in one year is going to cost you $1.02. So that's just taking $1 and 2% more. But you can think of this apple more generally as just all of the goods and services in the economy. So the cost of buying average things. Now the question that I have for you is how many apples can you buy today? Pretty easy. You have $100 today. Apples cost $1, so you can buy 100 apples. And the other question is how many apples could you buy a year from now? So a year from now, that $100 has become $110. But apples have also gotten more expensive. And so if we divide $110 by $1.02, we find that we can buy 108 apples, about 108 apples in a year. And so we see that in terms of your purchasing power, your money has not grown by 10%, it has actually grown by 8%, because before you were able to buy 100 apples, 
And now you can buy 8% more apples. You can buy 108 apples. So we see that although the investment you're getting is going to increase your physical money by 10% because things are also getting more expensive, that's why this 8% is lower than this 10%. And if you want an explicit formula for how we get this, you would just divide 1.1, which was your investment return, divided by 1.02, which was your inflation rate, and you would get about 1.08, which is your 8% growth in purchasing power. And so this was the forward direction. We found that if you're currently at today, a year from now, your money can grow by 8% in terms of purchasing power. We can also work in the reverse direction. We can ask if you have a certain amount of money in a year from now, how much money is that equal to today in terms of purchasing power? And then we would just divide by 1.08. So now let's go ahead and just look at these two different decisions. The decision I'm trying to make, again, either you're going to not get your PhD. So you're gonna continue working your $80,000 job, continue getting raises, and that'll be the way you go. The other option is that you will get your PhD. So you're gonna take five years, you're gonna quit your job first, it's a full-time PhD, and you're gonna take five years to get your PhD, and then you will start making the $150,000, start getting raises on that. Which one is worth it? So we need to look at what is the present value. Present value means if I'm currently at today, so where I'm at right now, what is the value of this decision in today's dollars versus what is the value of the PhD decision in today's dollars? And so first looking at not getting a PhD, in the first year, I'm gonna make $80,000, but I need to divide that by 1.08. Why? Because of the same reasons we talked about here. Since this money is gonna come in one year, we need to divide it by 1.08 to get the value of that money today. And that's why the first year of not getting a PhD the present value of that would be 80,000 divided by 1.08. Now let's go one year forward. The second year is going to be 80,000. Now we're gonna get a 5% raise on the 80,000. So I multiply that by 1.05. And then I need to divide that by 1.08 squared. The reason it's squared is because now we're looking two years into the future, but we're still crucially asking the question about what is that income worth today, which is two years prior. And so we have to divide by 1.08 to get back one year. And then we have to divide by 1.08 again to get back to the present day. And so that ends up being dividing by 1.08 squared. And after you understand that, the pattern becomes very simple. If we look three years out, it's going to be $80,000. Two years worth of raises, so it's 1.05 squared. So 5% raise one year, another 5% raise after that. And now we divide by 1.08 cubed because we're looking three years out. And that's how all of these values are calculated. So if I were to add up all of these values up until some whatever number of years I'm looking out into the future, then that is going to give me the current present value of this income stream today at zero when I'm actually choosing whether or not to make that decision. We can do the PhD option in a very similar way. So I'm getting a stipend of $20,000 per year, one year after the PhD starts but we have to divide that by 1.08. So it's gonna be 20,000 divided by 1.08. And actually it's the same looking formula for the next five years. Because my stipend, if you remember, is not increasing. We're not getting raises on the stipend. So that's the first five years. And then at the sixth year, so that will be the end of the first year of working your higher salary job, you're gonna be making $150,000 divided by 1.08 to the power of six. And then you start seeing raises on that. So for completeness, at seven years, you're gonna see $150,000 times a 5% raise, and of course, divided by 1.08, which is the purchasing power factor to the power of seven. And we can also just continue this pattern as long as we would like. And if we add up all these numbers on the right, we're gonna get exactly the present value of choosing to get a PhD, again, in terms of today's dollars. And then the very simple question we need to ask, is how many years out would we need to go? So how far ahead do we need to draw this timeline such that the present value of this income stream related to not getting a PhD is equal to the present value of this income stream, which is related to getting a PhD. When those two things are equal, at that time point, the present value of those two income streams are equal, and that's what we call the break-even point, or when we see the return on the investment from getting our PhD because after that point, the PhD is gonna win out. But before that point, not getting a PhD is gonna win out. So the main question we need to ask ourselves is, is that break-even point something we're comfortable with? You can write a pretty easy computer script to just do these for you and draw the graphs, and that result is shown here. So we see that if these are our conditions, 
then we're going to break even after 15 years. Again, what that means is that before 15 years, not getting a PhD would be the more financially viable option in terms of today's dollars, but after 15 years, getting a PhD is gonna be the more financially viable option. So the main question you need to answer for yourself is, do I want to wait 15 years to see a return? And that's a question that every person will have a different answer for. And another number we get off this graph is that the total amount of money you're gonna make in your lifetime, again, in terms of today's dollars, is 22% higher if you choose to get a PhD versus don't get a PhD. So another way you can attack this question is asking, uh, first, is it worth it to wait 15 years for me? But also, is it worth it if I'm getting a 22% increase in my lifetime earnings? Again, these are not set yes or no questions. They depend on your situation. And the other thing I want to say is that little changes to our setup can have pretty big impacts on these numbers. For example, let's say that the PhD took you six years to complete. Of course, sometimes you just don't know how long it's going to take. If the PhD takes you an extra year to complete, then it turns out your break-even point shifts from breaking even at 15 years to breaking even at 21 years. So the very interesting thing is that an extra year of PhD, one extra year of PhD takes six extra years to break even. And the reason is that for that extra year you're getting your PhD, you're missing out on this much higher full-time salary if you stuck to working your $80,000 job where you're getting raises. Okay, so there's an opportunity cost for every extra year of education you're getting. And we can change other factors too. For example, let's say your investment vehicle was not 10%, but it went up to 15%, then we see that it takes you also 21 to 22 years for you to break even. So the main point I want to get across is just that little changes in your assumptions can have pretty big impacts in your future value calculations. And the last thing I'll say in this video is that this is not necessarily the complete way to do this analysis. For example, we took into account all these factors. You could have done an even simpler analysis if you wanted to, for example, ignore salary growth, ignore interest rates, and ignore inflation then you could have done a more rough back of the envelope type calculation. If we do include those factors, we get a more complete analysis, but that doesn't mean you can include more factors. For example, let's say you're getting your PhD in a higher cost of living area. Then you want to adjust all of these numbers here so that you're taking into account the fact that you're paying more to get your PhD. So you can kind of make this as complex as you want, but the main point of this video is just that this is the way you would do it. I like to look at it visually in terms of a side-by-side -side timeline and use this tool called present future value or sometimes it's called time value of money to get a rough idea about how long it's going to take you to see a return on your investment when you're making a decision. So hopefully I've showed you it's not as scary as it might seem at first. If you learned something in this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this and I'll see you next time.